I would like to welcome you to lecture 12. This lecture is on the sensing revolution. This is part one. This is part of the sensing topic, which is covered in the subject future farming technologies. Future farming technologies is a component of the Bachelor of Agriculture and Technology, which is offered at both North Melbourne Institute of TAFE and Melbourne Polytechnic. Please visit our website at www.nmit.edu.au for further information on this course and other courses that we deliver. My name is Dr Nikki Cooley. The image presented at the start of this lecture is an IR camera mounted on a balloon. This image was collected as part of Ashley, Ashley Wheaton's research which involved a collaboration with Sadi and CSIRO and Yolumba Wines. This image shows an irrigation trial where vines were stressed. You can see that there is a variation in the temperature. This is indicated by a change in colour. For example, the cooler temperatures tend to be darker blues and purples, while the warmer temperatures are yellows and oranges. This sensor shows a link between a grapevine stress and reduced water availability. In this lecture, we will look at three learning objectives. We will describe and explain the relationships between production efficiencies, technology and performance in agricultural industries. We will evaluate and examine different technologies in sensing and we will interpret, communicate and present ideas using appropriate terminology. This lecture is one part on the topic of sensing. In this topic you will learn a number of things. You will learn the theory and the concepts behind sensing. This will be delivered across lecture 12 part 1 and lecture 12 part 2. We will explore some practical competencies this will be conducted in the workshop on sensing which is coming up. You will build a simple sensor from scratch. This is part of an assessment. And this topic will also be complemented with a couple of lectures on associated topics. That is, we will be looking at technologies when you combine sensing and modelling. We will be looking at technologies when you combine sensing and climate change. In this lecture, we will start with an introduction to sensing. We will look at the very important process of the implementation of sensors in agricultural systems. We will also examine senses and associated resources. Some of the things that you should think about while we are exploring the topic of sensing is how has agriculture industry used the advancements in sensing and sensing communication to increase productivity? What are the advantages and disadvantages of sensing? How do the economics of sensing balance up? In part two, we will concentrate on exploring some commercial systems and examples of where sensing has successfully been used. So let us start. A sensor is also called a detector. You can think of a sensor as a converter that measures a physical quantity. The physical quantity is converted into a signal, which can be read by an observer or by an instrument. A sensor does not need to be electronic, but there are many examples of electronic sensors. Sensors and sensing systems are used in agricultural enterprises. I've started this lecture with calling it a sensing revolution. Why would I do that? Well, the scientific community has been using sensing technologies for many years, about 50. With the exception of soil sensing, most of this technology has not infiltrated into the agricultural industries. There have been good reasons for the lack of infiltration in, into in agricultural in, in, industries. 
These include inhibition to cost. Sensors have been traditionally expensive. A high level of expertise is required to both install, keep, monitor, and relate the information to an output that is wanting, i.e. an output in production or a return in economics. And there has not been many adoption strategies placed forward to the industry. Many of the farmers in Australia are in the age group of between the 50s and 60s. Many of these do not see the point of this kind of technology and have been against uptake. That was until very recently, however, when communities started to embrace smartphones or iPhones. This has made a huge difference in the attitudes of many farmers towards sensing technology. What the iPhone did was it created a very usable interface. It's innate. A small child can pick up an iPhone without any instruction and after a few moments of playing, navigate it, their way around its very basic functions. The fact that you have better innate software means that there is more or a higher potential of uptake. There is a different attitude towards sensors. They're not as scary as they perhaps once were. Other components of the industry are changing. Costs are coming down. Because of the clever interfaces, the requirement for expertise is being reduced. There is a commercial market which is delivering expertise as well. That is a fee for service. We can put your sensors in, we will interpret the data for you. And thus there is a change in agriculture. There has been an expansion of adoption in these technologies and this considers, continues to be so. There is still a lot of work required in adoption before these technologies are truly integrated into the systems to their full potential. You are learning about sensors at a very exciting time in agriculture. So what are the ideal requirements for any one given sensor? Well, I have listed what I consider the main features that you need to consider. A sensor needs to be reliable. And I mean reliable in the environment that it's put in. It needs to, be, or it needs to output technically significant data. The sensor needs to be robust. That is, can it work in the farm environment? That does link to its reliability to some extent. The energy demands of the sensor need to be considered. This currently is one of the major problems with sensors. How do you supply energy to sensors in a farm environment? Do you use solar power, for example? If you do use solar power, how do you deal with data collection at night? How do you deal with the problems of batteries? These all need to be considered in both operational costs and functionality of use. Sometimes sensor installation can be overlooked, but it is essential in many situations to get this right. The sensor installation should reflect the equipment theory and the operations of the sensor. Incorrect installation can lead to misleading information. Many sensors require calibrations. You need to understand what the calibration is and the frequency of calibrations that need to be carried out in order to obtain optimal functionality of your sensor. The costs need to be calculated and this can be quite complex. A cost needs to reflect the return the information achieves. Some sensors don't directly measure productivity and therefore this can aid the complication of the cost. The main advantages to sensors is the savings in labour. Spatial is how a sensor collects data over a physical space over the paddock or over the whole farm, for example. 
Temporal considerations are how often a sensor collects data. Both spatial and temporal sensor output should be meaningful to the sensor's functionality. Too much data and a too high a sense, uh, sensing temporal aspect, i.e. if you collect your data points in seconds when you only need them every hour, for example, will result in a large build-up of data which will be costly not only from a power perspective but from a communication perspective. If you have one sensor in a paddock, does this truly reflect your variation across the paddock? Well, that depends on what the sensor is and how it's sensing. But all of these things have to be considered carefully. <coughs> A sensor must be simple to operate. Ideally, it would be innate like an iPhone, but the technology is quite a way from achieving this. It costs a lot of money in development in order to make a sensor display innate. The information the sensor displays must be meaningful. Not only must the data be relevant, but it must be meaningful in a production output perspective. The next part of the lecture, I will go into some detail about sensing, and as I do, I may be giving you some commercial examples of sensors. I want to make it clear, though, that I am not promoting or recommending or endorsing any one particular sensor technology over another. I am just using them as examples. There are often many excellent examples of commercial sensors, and if they are not covered in this topic, it is no reflection of their functionality, reputation or performance, but rather is a reflection of the amount of time I have to cover this topic. In order to have a true understanding of sensor and sensor devices, you should perhaps start with recognising the concepts of this technology. You can lay out uh, this kind of, you can use this kind of layout, sorry, to enable you to help understand the concepts of sensors. The first area you can begin to explore is the concept of the sensor, the system, the components and the devices. For example, if you are measuring temperature, you may be using a change in voltage to indicate the temperature. That would be a description of the concept. You would also include some basic physics which relates voltage with temperature in this section. You would highlight the observation. That is, what is the measurement you are outputting? In this case, it would be a physical measurement of voltage with an algorithm that converts it into a temperature. You would then look at what can the sensor do? What is the capabilities of the sensor? How often can it measure temperature in our example? How accurately can it measure temperature? Is it plus or minus one degree? Or is the accuracy less at plus or minus 10 degrees? What is the field of view or the area of the temperature measurement? You would then look at how does it process this information, the concepts for the inputs and outputs? What are the functions? How is the measurement made? And finally, the physical properties. Where is the sensor and what is it made from? What is the power supply? How is the power attached to the physical entity of the sensor? What is its weight? Does it have minimal and maximum operating conditions? Who produced this sensor? And what are the requirements for calibration? All of these can be listed in a, in a diagram similar to this, which will give you a very thorough and overview of any one particular sensor that you are reviewing. This diagram, produced by CSIRO, allows us to explore the key components for sensors in yet further detail. Each of the boxes that we looked at before are shown on the screen sensor device, capabilities, processes, physical properties and observations. But within each of these boxes you can see more complexity or detail about the component. The lines in the diagram show 
the connectiveness or links between part of the senses and its components. So, for example, how does the sensor change the physical entity into the observation? This link is shown on the slide. A sensor may have a number of functions or operations. These operations can be modelled by models that are developed to specially do this. This can help with not only the development of the sensor, but in order to see how well it can function. These models tend to be very technologically advanced, and to be honest, their, under, their interpretation is outside the level of most of us and requires a high degree of understanding and training. That said, it is a useful tool for assessment. Sensors can be categorised across two types. There are the active sensors and the passive sensors. An active sensor is a sensor that self-generates an electrical output signal, such as a thermocouple. A passive sensor is one that requires an external power source to provide an electrical output signal, such as an LDR or thermomister. Sensors can be defined as a type of transducer Although there is some debate about this, as some experts emphasise that a transducer is any device that converts one form of energy into another, and in many cases, without any association with the sensor itself. It is also worth noting that some sensors require sensor condition, signal conditioning. Signal conditioning is where the output requires some kind of processing in order to make sense of the signal. This could involve such things as amplification, attenuation and or filtering. This results in additional electronic components being required in the sensor. You also need to understand if set signal conditioning is a requirement of the sensor. And if so, be mindful of this in not only the aspects of installation but also operation and function and possibly even calibration. Ideally, all sensors, particularly those on the commercial market, would adhere to a set of standards. Standards are important in this industry as it limits mistakes and incorrect data. It allows standardizations between a sensor made by one company versus a sensor made by another. It enables quality control of operation and data output. There currently are two standard requirements or bodies, the International Bureau of Weights and Measurements, and these are supported by other international institutes, as well as the International Organisation for Standardisation, or ISO. You will often see that a sensor will abide or adhere to a number of ISO or BIM or BIPM requirements. On the screen is a conceptual example of a sensor. This illustrates a measuring transducer system structure that may or may not require battery and an additional electrical circuit according to its sensor type. You will see it's constructed of a physical phenomena, i.e. it's trying to measure maybe temperature. There is an electrical circuit, there may be a battery and there is an output electrical signal. We will be looking at this conceptual sensor in more detail in the workshop. An important component of the sensor is what we call the sensor transfer function. The sensor transfer function is a mathematical function. It explains the relation between a physical measure parameter, which is also referred to as the stimulus or phenomenon, and the system response, which is usually an electronic output signal. The formula is simple. S, which equals the electrical output signal, is determined by F and P. P is the stimulus. The output voltage variation can be either linear or nonlinear, and it represents an inverse function expressed as F minus 1 or F by S. 
The figure on the screen demonstrates two different types of sensor transfer functions. The red line is linear and the blue line is the nonlinear response in either direction. The output signal will depend on a specific sensor characteristic variation and therefore both responses can be directly associated and usually have some kind of relationship like what is demonstrated on the graphical curve. What this is basically showing is the transfer function is defined as either linear or nonlinear. The simplest transfer function is the linear transfer function which graphics a straight line and this is expressed as S equals B plus M multiplied by P. B is the output signal where the stimulus is zero, M is the slope or gradient and P is the stimulus in intensity. Note that B and M are constraints and the S output varies according to P input. This is a simple mathematical formula to demonstrate the relationship of a straight line graph. Here we have demonstrated a linear transfer function. Measuring directionally the temperature with an LM35 sensor and using a multimeter set in millivolts, we can determine the temperature. The function of this sensor is S equals zero plus 10 millivolts times the output P. Of the system we were describing in the slide before, you can see the transfer functions and its associations. This is illustrated in the graph. I'd like you to spend a few moments thinking about this. This graph shows you how we determine accuracy, and it also shows you how we determine the maximum measurement and the minimal measurement. It is important on sensor development that all of these considerations are monitored and recorded. You can see what we call the phenomenal range and how that is calculated. The response that we are exploring here is a linear one and this is shown. We also have in red the ideal transfer function. You'll see the slope gives you the sensitivity relation the area between A and B gives you the span. The area between 0 and A is the threshold. And the full scale is demonstrated on the y-axis, and in this case is between 0 and 100%. A very important component of sensing in an agricultural environment is that of power. What I mean by power is the amount of energy that is available to the sensor at any one point in time. Power is often thought of a compromise. That it is a compromise between the energy requirements of the capture of the data versus the temporal data requirements. How often is the measurement needed? Is it needed once a day, once an hour, or once every 15 seconds, for example? Power can be needed for two components. One, to operate the physical nature of the sensor but the same power source in some situations may also be, be required to communicate the data, such as in systems that are connected to wireless communications or radios. As power is such an issue, the development in technology for overcoming this issue has had a lot of attention. Some new advances can be seen in the hoist sensor, where ultra-low power sensors have been developed. These are sensors with very low power requirements and many of them are used in, in, in outside environments. The energy requirement is based on biochemical sensors and actuators and signal acquisition. There is also a, a component of conditioning for these sensors. This may be the future of sensing in agriculture if we can develop such technologies to enable both low power requirements and efficient power providers. You can pause this lecture here and read these notes in more detail.
Another important component of sensing is that of data collect, um, communication. Manual methods rely on the user collecting the data themselves. This can be high in labour and costly in time, and therefore tends to be expensive and not utilised readily in, in agriculture environments. The accuracy is determined by the, uh, the user, and so therefore there can be some interpretation in the data, especially if you have different people accessing the data and recording. There are automated methods, and these tend to fall into two categories, those of wired and those of wireless. Wired communication may be a good option. It's reliable, it has low energy costs, but it is expensive in initial infrastructure costs. It may be a good option if your sensor is buried and you have stock roaming around. Wireless, on the other hand, tends to be the preferred method of communication in many agricultural systems. It can be, the wireless communication can be done by radio frequencies or microwave frequencies. The type of communication tends to depend on the frequency that it uses. Some of these frequencies are good to have the associated standards. For example, the microwave uh, communications has Zigbee standards, and you would want to check that your set, uh, communication was Zigbee compliant. Some of the communications are radio, and if the frequency is of a certain type, these require licenses. You can be breaking some laws here, so be very mindful of what you're installing and check the regulations. If in your enterprise your monitoring requires more than one sensor, as often the case, you will need to set yourself up a network of sensors. A network of sensors is a system of communicating that data using one or more sensors. You need to be mindful that the data is being communicated effectively and accurately. There is great potential for error if networks are not set up correctly. And ideally you would have a system of alarms in your system and this can tell you when data is not being collected or if there is a problem with the data collection and therefore the interpretation of the information. One set of uh, standards that enables quality in your network communication is that of the uh, Zigbee compliance. These are a suite of operating standards for networks. The definition is Zigbee is a specification for a suite of high-level communication protocols used to create personal area networks built from small, low-power digital radios. Zigbee is based on an IEEE 802 standards. IEEE standards are also other areas to look for to show that your uh, network and components of your network is compliant. Though low powered Zigbee devices often transmit data over long distances, they can do this by passing through what we call intermediate devices that enable them to reach distant ones. This creates what we call a meshed network. One point of difference about this kind of communication is that the network may not have a centralised control or high power transmitter receiver able to reach all of the network devices. The decentralised nature of such a wireless ad hoc network make them suitable for applications where a centre node can't be relied upon. This can be very useful technology in an agricultural system. The following <coughs> is a theoretical construction of wireless networks and the relative components required. You need to design the network. That it comes under the heading of system architecture. This needs to ensure that you have thought about um, buildings or other obstacles that may be in, in the way, that your network is connective and that it can in fact do the function it's required. Then there is what we call the gateway or the network controller. This is the node that takes all the other information from the measurement nodes. The measurement nodes are nodes that are connected directly to each sensor. These communicate the data to the network, or sorry, to the gateway. A measurement may go through a number of measurement nodes before it gets to the gateway, or it may go directly to the gateway. 
and the gateway communicates the software. There may be a different frequency to communicate the data between the gateway and the software than th that is used to communicate the data between the measurement nodes and the gateway. The software is defined as the interface with the user. It usually is in the form of the data in some kind of visually pleasing manner. There may be some controllers in the software that feed back to the system. In this sort of system, information can come from the measurement node through to the software and user and vice versa. When considering your network connectivity and considering components of your sensor, you need to look at the temporal and the spatial characteristics for your system. This is particularly pertinent in agriculture for a number of reasons. From a temporal perspective, information is required often at a phenological or a time of year or possibly a time of day. The information may be required at a specific time of day that is integrated or accumulative and therefore the way you collect those measurements is critical to the interpretation of the measurement. And there are many factors from the spatial aspect too. Are you showing and understanding the variation that you need in order to link your output with your optimal return? This is where the field of precision agriculture has developed from, and we will cover this in another topic. Therefore, spatial data is the collection of data over an area, and this may be essential to your interpretation. You need to specifically manage areas or the units of the area too. A point sensor is a sensor that physically collects information at a specific area. The location of this sensor is critical as it represents the entire area, usually excellent for the temporal characteristics. An example of a point sensor is a soil sensor. It goes into the ground at a specific point and you make an assumption that it represents a larger area. A spatial sensor is quite different to that of a point sensor. A spatial sensor collects information over most or, or all of the area to be sensed. The information is truly representative of the area being monitored. It is usually bad from a temporal characteristic perspective. That is, it can't collect the data as often as a point sensor is able to. It is usually associated with large amounts of data. An example of a spatial sensor is that of an IR camera suspended on a balloon above an area that's being monitored, like the image on the front of this, of this lecture. So neither a point sensor or a spatial sensor is ideal. Does it not make sense then to combine these two sensors in a system? And this will give you the best compromise. Data storage is another important component of any sensing system. Data storage refers to the computer data storage. It comprises of memory components, devices and media that retain digital computer data used for computing some interval or time. The image on the slide shows you the number of layers involved in data collection. There is an application layer, a transport layer, a network layer, a data link layer and a physical layer. All of these have to be comprehended across a management plane and across a mobility plane as well as a power plane. A sensing interface is quite a common component in your computer storage system. Referred to as SSI or Simple Sensor Interface, it is a protocol for simple communications designed for data transfer between computer, computers or user terminals and smart sensors. The SSI protocol is an application layer protocol as in an example of the OSI model. This indicates best, pra best practice of this kind of information transfer. The summary on this slide gives you the advantages and disadvantages over sensor compared to sensor, sensor nodes over sensor networks. 
A sensor node tends to have a low memory, it has low power capabilities, low processing capabilities, and it's inapproachable, that is, that the end user, the farmer, can't manipulate it in any way. While the sensor has efficiency requirements and it's highly dense, it is approachable, it has high memory and power is not an issue. The sensor storage capabilities can be listed as follows. There are a large number of events that need to be recorded. There is query handling capability often in these units. There is what we call data streaming. There is an aging mechanism and some form of data organization. In the system, you will have centralized storage. This will consist of a central server where there is ample power, sufficient storage and single point failure. This system will have fast query processing capabilities high communication capabilities and will be seated on a sparse network, that is, in frequent number of events. There are far more of the events in the sensor than there is in the network, for example. There will be low data transfer issues that have to be dealt with, but there may be some scalability issues under your centralized storage system. Distri distributed storage facilities may also be present. Storage at each node, local computation, scalability and den dense networks all make up your distributed storage network. In your dense networks there will be frequent events and high data transfer. In these dense networks you will have slower query processing. You may get flooding, that's where all the information comes in at once. Distributed indexing and what we call drill down querying. That sets a hierarchy in how data is processed. Some sensing systems do not have a requirement to store data, or at least they don't have a requirement to store data over a long period of time. Others may do. Where data storage is required for optimal system operation or for legal requirements, you need to be able to think about and consider data loss or degradation. So what do we mean by data degradation? Well, it is simply the decay of data. It is caused by small electronic change of a bit in a RAM disperses, for example. It can result in altered code or stored data. It happens all of the time. However, usually the code is quite long and therefore one or two small changes does not result in a significant change in the output. This is not always the case though. There are several storage operations um, options for storing data. There is solid state media, we know them as memory sticks. Magnetic medias, for example floppy disks are an example of a magnetic media. An optical media, an example of that is a DVD and the very old fashioned and less used nowadays is that of the paper media or punch cards as an example. All of these suffer from decay of data. But there are different types of decay and different magnitudes of the problem depending on what storage option is selected. If long-term storage of your sensing system is important, you may wish to review and understand your network data management protocols some of these enable and reduce the risk of backup and recovery communications. The information on the slide is an example of such a commercial product that is available. The following list is some of the advantages of sensing that you may wish to consider. It can be a cost effective way of monitoring a system's outputs. It can potentially lead to an increase in productivity. It may reduce labour requirements of a certain part of your enterprise. It may enable new insights into your operation efficiencies, both good and bad. It has the potential to optimise the inputs of the enterprise. For example, in agronomy, how much nitrogen you add can be optimised based on some NIR technologies. If you are able to optimise all of your inputs by sensing all your inputs, 
then theoretically you are able to optimise your outpoints in a dynamic way. And it may assist in making complicated management decisions. While there can be many advantages, there can be equally as many disadvantages. The cost and the time of sensing may not be worth the return. The assumption that the data is fit for purpose. What we mean by this is that your direct measurement of one input relates to an output. Therefore, the relationship of your system limits need to be clearly understood. What I mean by this is you may be measuring soil water by a sensor and you may be making your nitrogen fertiliser application based on your soil water measurements. This may, in most situations, relate to optimal plant uptake of your fertiliser. However, if you have some unusual climatic events, for example, a situation that stops tomato opening, then your relationship may fall down. If this occurs commonly, then you need to ask yourself, is your data fit for purpose? You may be better not sensing at all, or measuring nitrogen concentration directly in the plant, for example. And often in some systems, there is a high level of knowledge required. You need to be able to relate the sensing knowledge to the agricultural system and its outputs. And this can be a challenge. So this brings me to the end of this lecture. Hopefully now you'll have understood what a sensor is. You'll understand what makes up sensing systems and be able to describe a, um, a concept of one. You'll be able to describe all the inputs of your concept sensing system. You will have thought and understand about the limitations of communicating the data and understand important aspects of sensing networks. We have touched on some of the generic advantages and disadvantages of sensing. This is the end of Lecture 12, Part 1. Please now watch Lecture 12, Part 2 for different types of sensing and some commercial examples.